When I spoke to Amanda Brown on Zoom, it was days before her first solo album, Eight Guitars, was released. 20 years in the making see the prolific instrumentalist and composer stand out as a singer-songwriter. From his home studio in Sydney, he says, it's been in the background for a long time. I think I'm a pretty shy person. The role of soloist or main artist doesn't sit incredibly comfortably, but I think it's an integral part of the times when you release an album, you have to reconcile with that. For many, Brown is known as a member of a band joined just before he was out of his teens, and knows that this could be the benchmark by which this album is measured. This relationship with the go-betweens means there's a very high bar to reach in terms of songwriting, and it's a little scary, he says. Although he hadn't been on the performance circuit for some time, Brown was busy behind the scenes. He has been composing music film television for more than 20 years, and has composed music such productions as Brazen Husses, Baby Teeth IFDS. The intricate sound worlds bring drama that unfolds on the screen to life, while at same time standing alone as fascinating pieces of music. Eight Guitars is a blend of Brown's experience in bands and writing for the screen, these atmospheric songs have a cinematic glow. Some were screen projects Kieran J, on the guitar Callanan's first single, Freedom Song, was originally written for the 2003 film Floodhouse, and some were as part of a daily creative exercise, or what Brown jokingly called the Nick. The Cavern. What connects these songs is the arrogance of eight guest guitarists, one for each track. I wanted to work with different people who aren't your typical guitarists, he says. The guitar is one of the instruments that many people play but cannot enjoy. It's about their own creativity and the effects they have. Brown is far from being the only screen composer with a band background, citing Danny Elfman and Ryan Lott of Sun Lux as prominent examples. He calls two environments very complementary. What I like about influences of contemporary music and pop world is production techniques. You can use a mix of these techniques with effects, production, and the way the whole mix sits, to create really interesting music. One of the album's many highlights is a beautiful cover of the church's 1981 single The Unguarded Moment, recorded in 2022 for writer Kirsten Croth's podcast about 70s and 80s Australian music, Nota Mira. While songwriter and church frontman Steve Kilby, co-author of another track on album, Light Lingers On, expressed dislike for the song 1992, Brown's gentle commentary gives lyrics a liberating perspective that acts especially in their context tell friends with cameras. The hands don't hang met hey, just make me feel like they're breathing a vulnerable moment. Kilber's connection to Brown and his music dates back decades. He was also once in Jack Frost, a short-lived band with Brown's former partner and former bandmate, the late Grant McLennan. Brown was playing live in a cafe in mid-80s when he was discovered by go-betweens and soon found himself thrown to other side of world. There's still a long way to go, but I see women playing instruments in groups now, and that wasn't a normal thing in the days of the go-betweens. For next four years, he provided backing vocals for the Brisbane group responsible for creating striped sunlight sound that still ripples in Australian indie music today, and played violin, oboe, guitar and keys. The offer came with an offer to join the group and move to London, he says. Before that, things like this were an absolute dream that happened to other people. I left the university and moved to London, and it was a baptism of fire. Brown recorded two albums with the group Tallulah in 1987 and the band's masterpiece, 16 Lovers Lane in 1988. He had a romantic relationship with McLennan, one of the band's two songwriters. While songs at 16 Lovers Lane were about ecstatic early stages falling in love, the contributions of her songwriter friend Robert Forster reflect a deterioration relationship with drummer Lindy Morrison. The album offers dialectical views on the same subject, creating a fragmented, beautiful whole. Among them, they are really some of the greatest love songs, Brown says. But same reason, historically, at least for women, I never wanted to get caught up in the role of muse, an empty vessel directing creativity of male genius. 
One condition of Brown joining band was that he did not receive songwriting royalties, as the band was built around core Forster McLennan partnership. He accepted himself as a player rather than a songwriter. But while he and McLennan lived together at Bondi Crossing in Sydney, he wrote the band's best-known song, the brilliant but strangely melancholic Streets of Your Town. While accompanying the song, Brown found the song's distinctive chorus of brilliance. It was a rare go-between song that Forster hadn't heard before he was brought into the band. It really bothered me because I wrote those vocal parts and they are part of the song they're definitely worth 5 or 10 percent, he says. It's a pretty hard pill for Robert to swallow, to collect half of the royalties for that song because he literally did nothing. This is only part of the group's well-documented, but largely unilateral complex interpersonal history. Grant and I, the title of Forster's 2016 memoir, summarizes what is generally remembered and praised about the group. The 2017 documentary, The Go-Betweens, right here hardly included Brown and Morrison. They discovered that there was a directive from the group's management to exclude references to them on their official website. Forster and McLennan famously informed Brown and Morrison about their plans to distribute the go-betweens at the same pre-designed moment in 1989. In 2000, they recorded and toured under McLennan's name until his sudden in 2006, reorganizing the band without women. Morrison says in the documentary, we both refused to be identified as girlfriends, and that's what they did when they left us. They treated us like ex-wives and that was the biggest insult. Four years after the band disbanded, Lindy and I felt out of history, Brown says. We were very aware of how the roles of women have been diminished by those who have written history in the music industry, which is mostly men. Robert's book reinforced the idea that the group was just two of them and that everyone else was temporary and environmental. Yes, they were great songwriters, there's no denying but I also strongly believe that a group has a certain chemistry and sound and the group members are influenced by their own influence when creating the voice. Everything but the girl frontman Tracy Thorne's 2021 book My Rock and Roll Friend about her friendship with Lindy Morrison tried to fix the problem. I think the truth is somewhere in the middle of two books, Brown says. Old wounds aside, Brown's time at the go-betweens was formative. Morrison, with bassist John Will Steed a number of guest musicians vocalists, Forster refused to be involved, gave a 16 Lovers Lane concert at the Brisbane, Melbourne Sydney festivals in 2017-2018. Songs like The Devil's Eye and You Can't Say No Forever have been played live before. Eventually, the songs will stay and they are beautiful testaments of a really intense, incredible time, Brown says. The legacy of Go Between's lives on. Brown dated 16 Lovers Lane the year I was born and was a few years younger than me in 2013.